If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. This has been another episode sponsored by Online Horse College. If you haven't had a look at the wide variety of equine-specific accredited courses, then go to onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Our guest today again is John Downs, who's been here before, episode 235. So if you'd like to hear a little bit more about John and John's journey through horses, where he started off as a trail rider, went on to do some dressage, show jumping, eventing, and then ended up riding at an FEI level in dressage. He's gone on, he's done garrocha, stock work. If you talk about horses with John, he'll tell you he's probably done it. He's just a real good all-round horse person. And today he's going to talk to us about 10 tips to train in Harmony. How are you, John? Hello, Bernice. I'm good. Thank you very much. Good. Now, John, this title, 10 Tips to Train in Harmony, any particular reason you've shown this? Because you as a coach, do you find that people need to learn this? Is this what you're teaching mainly your students now? Yeah, um, I I think it's extremely important because I I think as we get older, our attitude in life and horses change. Uh, my, My attitudes are very, very different when I was younger and pushing very hard to, to achieve, you know, what I thought was marvellous things. And um, as I've got older, I realised that we all seem to get into horses for the love of horses, but then we lose our way. Mm. And um, the, the more I ride, the more I realise that people aren't really working with the horses. They're working for other goals like winning ribbons or, or or money or, you know, they want to dominate or something. You know, a lot of, there's not a lot of respect for the horse or harmony there. And, you know, these ulterior motives tend, tend to um, take away any sort of chance of developing a, um, a, a good relationship with your animal. I think what you said there, John, was really good about how you lose your way a bit. You know, you get into it because of the love of the horse, because of the connection you have with the horse, because of the way that you feel when you've got that with the horse. And sometimes you can lose your way. And I think the 10 tips to train in harmony, it's it's more of a, I don't know, it's almost like a coming up as a young child and be turning into a rebellious teenager and then, you know, that more mature attitude, I think, with horses. And some people have it all the time. But, you know, I just think it's lovely to see. And I think the whole equine science, I think as a culture, we're maturing more. Do you find that, that there's more emphasis on, on the harmony within the horse industry now than there used to be? Oh, totally. Um, there's so many different people talking about thinking or, or getting into the horse's space in a much more different manner two years ago. Like mm-hmm. the first horse I was involved with breaking in, that I, I wasn't doing it, I was just assisting. But the guy who was, who was working with the horse went and cut the horse's mouth with a razor both sides. Yeah, you thought um, that was normal. So it wouldn't pawn a bit. Mm. Yeah, mm. and you know, I thought, oh, wow, that's not the way it's done, you know. And, um, of course, I look at that and now I'm totally horrified. And there's a, a number of people in the industry who are – promoting harmony with the horses and a lot of people think that, oh if you're going all airy fairy you're not being competitive um that you've got to be a strong and determined rider to get to the top but i don't think they're mutually exclusive i think you can be uh, a very competitive rider and, and still have respect and understanding for your animal and, and make the task and the, the journey through learning easier for the animal and, and your students yes in, in the yes. end for sure um, as a coach, I'm trying to make it easy for my students to make it easy for their animals. Mm, mm, yep, yep. Makes the whole, makes the world go round, doesn't it? And I, I agree. I think there's a lot of, of really top riders who are very, very good with their animals all the way through. Yeah. yeah. Now, the first tip that we've got is let the horse tell you it's wrong. Don't assume. Can you speak a little bit about that? That's the first tip. Yeah. Look, as a coach, um, I, I often you know, doing schools or watching students or watching other people compete and ride. And it's easy to stand on the ground and go, oh, well, that's the, that's the story there, you know, that, you know, the horse is rushing or the horse is not. And, you know, it's it's only when you, you, you take the time to get to know the horse, like sitting in the saddle and, and letting the horse explain what's wrong. And horses can't lie. Um, you know, often horse, you know, riders, riders are very, very good at masking problems. 
um, e- either intentionally or not. And uh, but a horse can't. And so some riders will, will brutalise the horse into a frame. Um, but the horse might be sore for some reason, or the saddle might be feeding, or the bit's incorrect. And, you know, so the horse, as soon as you sit on it, the horse will tell you the whole story. Mm. And that's true. You only get that ability to do that by riding lots of horses. So you just you won't have a norm to start from if you only ride one or two horses. You've got to ride many horses over lots of years to be able to get on a horse. The horse will tell you it's sore, or it's rushing, or, or, or you know different things that are going wrong with it. And then you can start explaining the horse and fixing it up. But you've got to have a starting point. You've got to have a norm, an mm-hmm. average, before you can say, well, this is wrong and right. And as I'm always seeing riders masking what the horse is doing, you know, they, it's not round. Why is it not round? It's not because the rider's not being brutal enough on the mouth. It's generally not round because there's lots of rhythm or bend or the horse isn't sound or mm-hmm. there's lots of other reasons behind it. So the horse can't lie. So as soon as you put your bum in the saddle, um, you're you're opening up a dialogue with that horse, and I think the worst thing you can do when you get your bum in the saddle is to actually start telling the horse what to do. You should let the horse tell you what to do. Mm-hmm. And I know it sounds really, you know, not surreal, but um, airy fairy, but it's not. The ho- the horse will will let you know very very quickly where, where the faults in the training, um, yes. very very quickly. And you, you, I've watched you ride over many years, and you you tend to sit on the on the students' horses. Um, and probably for the same reasons that I do. So the horse can tell me what's wrong. I don't need to fix the horse up. I need to tell me what I I need the horse to tell me what's wrong. Mm -hmm. And sometimes as a coach, I think it's an ability to teach your students to listen to the horse. You know, they're not going to tell you in English, but you've still got to listen, yeah, in their language. Yep, yep. Yeah, you've got to to keep your mind open and, and, you know, ride, I know it sounds very, you know, very wanly, so. I yes. Heard of her, and yep. she always said to ride with soft eyes. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I'm very big on riding with soft eyes, and soft hands, and soft body, and letting the horse try to tell me what's going on. Mm. Because as soon as you start telling your story to the horse, well, often if the horse can't perform, well, it will tell you where to go, mm. um, either by shutting you out or, or becoming stiff. So once the horse feels realizes that you're trying to empathise with it, um, it will, will generally generally come around to your way of thinking because you're working as a unit. Yeah, yeah. All right. Now, the second one you've got is to not anthropomorphism. So horses can't think like humans. We have to think like a horse. So do you want to go and explain, just explain a little bit more what you mean by that? You know, I'm thinking of we sometimes do almost like my little pony. You know, my horse does this and does that, and we sort of treat them like, you know, little pony dolls and put words into their mouth and they think and they scheme and they do this and do that. But just explain a little bit more, you know, and we do it as a joke, but sometimes I think we've just got to make sure it is a joke and that we really do think, yeah, like a horse. Yeah, look, um, we, we are all guilty of it, particularly if we love our horses. Mm. Um, it, it's but the horse, if you're thinking about how a horse learns, there's five different ways a horse learns. And, you know, it, it, they don't learn like humans. And no. as soon as we start thinking how a horse learns, rather than how we learn, it becomes a whole different ball game. So it, this anthropomorphizing of, of the horse's reactions and 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 stimuli in certain situations to get a response are uh, uh, very, very erroneous. Um, and I say it's very, very nice to say, well, isn't he a lovely horse and, you know, he's just following me around because he loves me and things like that. But they're totally different, you know. We've got Mazdo's hierarchy of needs, which we'll talk about later, that it's very important that we draw a distinction. And once we draw that distinction, it then it's up to us as the trainer because when I'm sitting on a horse, I'm no longer a rider, I'm a trainer. Mm-hmm. And it's a, that's a very big difference. And so as a trainer when I'm on the horse, it's up to me to train. And if if I fail to teach, well, then if the horse fails to learn, I fail to teach. So it, it, I've got to think along how a horse learns and and how how I can modify those behaviours, to give me the responses I'm looking for. So thinking that, and I've heard it so many people say, "Oh, the horse won't do it." Yep. And yep. again, that's a very typical human response. You know, it's it's not your partner or your, your guys at work. It's the horse won't do it. You know. The horse won't do it because you haven't explained it um, mm. in, a, in a way that the horse can understand. So it, it's very, very easy to step into it. And it, it's more safe from riders who haven't had got a lot of experience at 
tend to slip into this way of riding and blaming the horse. Yep. And I, I, I've been lucky. My my mentor for many years was a um, a fairly grand chap, Meister Christian Peace. And when when I said oh, I'm having trouble, he would just say ride better. Mm. Um, which is a, is a good way to look at it because if you're failing, if you can, if you start putting on human emotions to a horse, well, that's a that's a very big mistake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Now you talked a little bit. You you know that was number two that horses can't think like humans. We have to think like a horse. Number three, and you touched it a bit before. If the horses fail to mm. learn, then you, as the rider trainer, has failed to teach. Do you want to talk any more about that? Yeah, oh yeah, for sure. Uh, as a trainer, this the, all these points that we're talking about link from it's a whole concept. So you're going to sure. find terms that I'll use in in one point, and I'll be using on the next because mm. Mm. they're all linked. But as a trainer, I have to think about about where I'm going and what I'm trying to do with that horse. You know, it's and if I'm not very clear in my concept, the horse won't understand it. So, look, and again, this is tying with another point later on, but I've got to actually be clear about what I'm trying to get through and then go about training that horse in the best possible way. Now, this can be, and this reason or another point, how horses learn. The main ones that we as trainers use a stimulus response, which we'll talk about later in habituation. But by overdoing things, we can get an extinction response, which where the horse will shut out the learned response and just tune us out because we've gone too far off with our way of training. So we've got to be very careful that we push the horse too far when we're trying to teach it. Um, so if the horse is failing to learn, I, as a trainer, I have to actually think about how I can make the task easier for the horse. So if it doesn't learn one way, say if I'm trying to improve the the collection of the horse, well, I can do that through lateral work by bringing inside high leg under. But I can also do that by doing transitions, down with transitions. So if he fails to learn through a through that way, well, then I have to come up with another method. And Mm -hmm. as a dressage trainer, I've I've got a bag of tools, just like a mechanic has um, a box of tools to fix your car. You know, he's got different spanners and hammers and things like that. Well, as a trainer, I've got a whole heap of different dressage exercises, you know, be they transitions or travers, rondvers, shoulder in, half steps, whatever, um, to fix up a problem with the horse. So uh, as a trainer, I've got to pull out the, the correct exercise so that the horse can then understand it to give me the response that I'm looking for. And that, that's the advantage of having that experience to be say, well, this doesn't work. The horse is getting confused here. I best back off, change mm-hmm. the subject, but come back at it from a different angle. And I uh, said, so that bag of tools you've got as a rider or as a trainer, be, be it as a coach, you helping your student or, or be it as a rider, um, helping your horse. Um, you, you have that repertoire there. And it's up to you as to how you're going to use it. So um, it, if I'm explaining correctly to my horse, if I'm showing, if I'm trying to make the right thing easy and the wrong thing hard, that's keeping the pathways open for the horse and he's going to continue to learn. But nothing, no animal will learn if it's stressed. You know, if your house is burning down and I come up and ask you an algebra problem, you're going to tell me where to go pretty quickly. Sure. Um, and it's the same for a horse. Once I start to confuse it, it, it won't try hard, it will shut down. So mm. confusion and pain and all these other responses that the horse naturally has, and we do too, will cause a horse to, to shut down, not open its mind and be pliable, but to become more rigid either in its body or its thinking. So, yep. yeah, you know, I'm trying to keep those pathways open with the horse. And the older I get, the more I'm looking to to modify my behaviour to, to get a result rather than being – I think when we're young, we're very, very – black and white. Mm, mm. Um, I know when I was 18, 19, 20, and I was very set in my mind about politics and the world and everything else. And as I get older, I think there's always two sides to a coin. And if I can't get there one way, I can generally get there another, mm, uh, particularly mm. for horse. Yep. Um, so it's up to me to keep pathways open. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right. Now you've got here the next one for point number four about a trainer will work on one problem at a time. Is that because of the way the horses the horse thinks? Going back to what you said before about horses can't think like humans, we've got to think like a horse. Exactly. Look, mm-hmm. I think humans are very poor at multitasking. Mm-hmm. Um, despite, I mean, I'm always told that girls can do two things at once, but <laughs> I think that's a fair. You know, but I can talk and 
walk at the same time mm. without falling over. It's a bit of a battle. And a horse, a horse is no different. So as a trainer, I, I when I get on the horse and thinking about that first point about letting the horse tell me what's wrong, um, say that the horse is on the forehand and generally most start is some sort of degree, give or take, and that causes rushing. Well, then I, I've got to fix that problem. And then before, once that problem is fixed, I then move on to the next. And a couple of things for, for coaches in particular and the riders to keep in mind that your basics are always your basics. You know, go stop, go where you want. And then you've got your, your scale of training. And it, and if you stick to those basics, then move on to your scale of training, you really can't go wrong in the training of a horse. But I, if I've presented with a horse that say it's got a problem in the flying chains, um, well, I say, well, where's the problem? Is it because it's on the forehand and, and lacking elevation or is it not understanding the aid and um, is the collection not sufficient? So, you know, I, I break it down, then I work on that problem. I don't work on the flying change. Mm. And, mm. and then once I've got the problem sorted, well, then I can move on to the next problem, the change of bend and flexion. And, and so it just goes from one level to the next. Now, that's what a trainer, a good trainer would do. And they would fix the problem before moving on to the next, not trying to come up with a solution for the overall thing but one thing at a time. Riders tend to want to do five things at once like you know the horse doesn't do a change so they'll try to muscle the horse through it and to improve the collection and the flexion and the bend and the understanding of the aids all in one hit and they want to look good when they do it. They want to yeah. keep the horse on the well and so they end up achieving nothing and, and wasting their time spinning the wheels and the horse is getting more and more confused by what's going on and just finally switching off. So uh, I think it's a huge difference between a trainer and a rider, and that's the reason why I'm always at my students to start thinking like trainers. So as soon as you put your bum in the saddle, you're a trainer, you're no longer a rider, and it's up to us to think like trainers, not just sitting on horses, passengers, you know. Mm -hmm. When you get a Japanese tourist out or something, they're, they're sitting on a horse, they're riders, they're, they're not trainers, but when you're actually trying to modify a horse's behaviour, then you're a trainer and you've got to think, like a trainer, you can't. You can no longer sort of make excuses for yourself. The horse fails to learn; you're failing to teach. Yep, yep, yep. Wait, can you hear anything? No, that's because we're waiting for someone with a good quality horse product to be advertised here. If that's you, then contact us, horsechats at horsechats dot com, and we'll send you the details. Thanks. All right, now number five here, we've got um, about riders understanding, well, you've said riders, but you mean trainers understanding. Hmm. Well, I always think that, you know, you go through, like when you're first riding, you're a passenger. You're just a passenger and the horse is sort of going around and then you start to pick up a little bit of, take on a bit of responsibility, yeah, for the way the horse goes. You know, look at the line, look at the way they're going. So this is sort of what you're calling the trainer. But either way, they need to understand principles such as stimulus response, habituation, flooding, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So if we can talk about those individually, I think that'll be good. You know, just give us your take on that and then we can break it down a little bit. So stimulus response. Okay. Yeah, look, these are all really interesting terms and for trainers, for teachers, for, for you know, just in normal everyday life. Now, so how horses learn, we're normally using two different methods to train a horse. Uh, the first one is stimulus response. So, you know, if I ask for the horse to do something, it doesn't respond, um, I'll then up the level of stimuli. So, unfortunately, in horse training, it is normally not always um, a negative reinforcement. So, it's ask, tell, demand. Uh, but you've got to be careful. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, I say they're negative. They're, we're reinforcing a negative way. We can do this in a positive way of clicker training and treating and using our voice and things like that. Um, so that's the reason why clicker training works so well on other animals and works well on horses too. Um, but it hasn't been really taken on in the dressage community, but it's been taken on in other horse sports. But um, but stimulus response forms in, into negative reinforcement generally. If if I put my leg on and the horse fails to respond, I, I try to apply another stimuli within about two-thirds of a second, which sounds like it's, it's sort of pretty mathematical. And and it is. If, if I wait too long, the, it's, the horse it's dropped out of the horse's time to respond you know it's, mm -hmm. yes it's, it's just become background noise again so i don't want to be too sharp i don't want to be too quick otherwise i'm giving the horse a, um, a fair chance and if i wait too long well then the horse has forgotten about it's not linking the aid um so i try to respond go up to the next level about two-thirds of a second and then if i've got to punish a horse say if i've got to give it a smack with the whip or a tap with the whip 
I then try to repeat the whole process so the horse learns within about eight seconds or so. Um, I think Andrew McLean, I think, talks about 10 seconds or something like that. But we're, we're all reading on the same page. We're talking about the same sort of stuff. Um, so if I do have to punish a horse for anything, I try to make sure I repeat it and the horse has learned, then learned the lesson, then I can move on. Hmm. Because if, again, like if I fail to explain to the horse why I got the smack, well, I've been cruel and stupid. Mm. Unfortunately, in the horse sports, there's too much stupidity and there's too much cruelty. Um, so it's up to me to explain to the horse why I backed that up with the whip or the spur or whatever uh, and make sure the horse fully understands it so I can leave that alone. And of course, that lesson will stick. But if I, if I haven't taught it properly, the lesson will not stick and it will come undone next time I ask. Is it a punishment, though, or is it just a stronger stimuli? Yeah, it's the strongest stimuli. Punishment is probably, I'm using the... Might, might be a bit hard to say course. that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm using a psychology term for it. Yeah, mm. so that probably is the hard word for it. Um, yeah, you know, I don't believe in, in smacking horses out and things like that. Mm. But mm. sometimes you do have to use the whip, but, and, but then it should be used judiciously and carefully. Yep. Um, on the other hand, positive reinforcement, or, you know, stimulus can be if I apply the aid, and the horse moves forward, well, then I back off and that yes. the reward is that I, I don't apply the second level. Um, the other point is that by it moving forward, I'm allowing the horse, um, this comes down to most of those hierarchy it needs, uh, a moment of serenity so mm-hmm. it can relax. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's the positive reinforcement. When I say to the horse, well, you've done right, I'm going to leave you alone. This is a really important concept because always going to look for that moment of serenity and quietness and not being troubled by the human. Um, so positive reinforcement can be the removal of the aid so the horse can get on with the job um, or it can be a sugar cube or a piece of licorice or, or whatever you like yeah. um, you know the, a big one for having a pocket full of licorice mm. all the time and treating my horses yeah. because I actually think I get better response if the horse gives me what I want so I get a change or something I stop the man give it say we'll try that again the horse is normally looking for that piece of licorice mm-hmm. so it, it's not so stupid so that's the positive reinforcement. So it can be the removal of a stimuli or it can be a, a treat or, or something along those lines. Then, you know, yeah, it's up to you to make sure that you think about how you, you're applying your force and, and how you're applying those negative and positive reinforcements. Yep. The, the next level, you know, when we're teaching horses habituation, now we, I used to break in a hell of a lot of horses, but I've been banned because I've been breaking up too many times. <laughs> but when I'm breaking in a horse, it's very important that a horse habituates to having humans around them and the, the stimuli that, I'm a, that it learns to have a saddle on its back or a saddlecloth or a bit in its mouth. And that's habituation. Like if a horse is scared of trucks, I tied up on the main road. After a day or two, it doesn't take any notice of trucks. It's become habituated to that to that response, um, to you know, to that stimuli. And the good thing about that is if it's habituated to something that it finds confusing or, or terrifying or, or scary or whatever, if it habituates to it, it then allows it to learn. So as I said earlier on, a scared horse won't ever learn. We can dominate it, but it's not really learning. So it's important that we think about having the horse habituated to certain environments and things that we're going to be doing in its training, be it long running or lunging or, or putting a saddle on its back. It's all habituation or having humans sit on its back. We never, when we break in the horse, just swing our leg up and get on it because you're going to get cleaned up. So we get it used to being bagged down. Then we put a saddle cloth on it and then a saddle and, you know, a roller or whatever. And we just build up from one level to the next to the next until it becomes old hat to the horse and the horse is just accepting it and keeping a calm mind. Mm-hmm. And that avoids all the accidents like bucking horses and all sorts of other things. And habituation we use all the time, like if your horse is scared of, a certain dressage grounds or the arena or trotting towards a car, you keep doing it uh, until the horse is used to trotting towards the judge's car or, or used yes. to an oxen or, yep. or having filling with pots underneath it or, or things mm-hmm. like that, you know? Mm-hmm. So, yep. again, it's a really important concept to keep in mind because the habituation can is generally a positive thing, but it can be negative as well. Like if you've got flapping legs, you know, loose lower leg, yes. the horse will never figure out – what's an aid and, and what's a mistake from the rider's mm-hmm. part. Mm-hmm. So, yep. or, or moving hands, you know, and so often the, and even at Grand Prix, we see riders with loose legs and moving hands 
And the poor old horse has to struggle through the confusion of it all because it's habituated to the, the constant slapping and banging from the rider. So habituation can be a positive, but can also be a negative through poor riding. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of people don't even think about that. And, you know, this comes back to probably one of my last points is that it's up to us just to be as still and as quiet and as subtle as possible so that when we do apply a stimulus, um, the horse can identify that stimulus, not be guessing about it. Yes. And, it, of course, if it guesses wrong, we'll probably reprimand the horse by doing using the reins incorrectly or, or, you know, or just telling the horse no and the horse will get confused and shut off. Mm-hmm. So um, habituation can be a positive or a negative. Okay. If you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look. Horsechats.com. All right. Then the next point was about flooding and understanding the principles of flooding. Yeah, look, um, you used to see it a lot years ago. You don't see it so much now. Um, people tie horses down. Um, you know, throw them to the ground. Uh, I've, I've seen lots of horses come through us to rebake in after those sorts of things have been done to it. You know, the, it's just overstimulus of the horse mm-hmm. and trying to elicit uh, a response where the horse actually shuts down. And, and generally, I think it's a negative way of training because you're really teaching the horse to shut off. And I don't ever want my horse to stop thinking. So it, it's not really immersion therapy. It's another step way past that. Uh, and so we, we don't really be wanting to put, you know, so bagging down a horse can go into a flooding situation if you just, you know, keep, you know, you start off with a, you know, um, sugar bag and you work your way up to big car poles and 100 people running around it. Uh, to me, that's flooding. And mm-hmm. I, I don't think it really achieves anything. The horse is just finally going to shut out everything rather than staying alert. So, you know, I'm, I'm not a fan of flooding, but a lot of people do it still but not as much as a few years ago. And another one that people should be aware of is extinction response. Like that's where if you push a horse past a certain point, be it due to pain or fear, the horse will will forget it's been trained and, and shut out its positive training and come up with a more primitive way of getting out of the situation, be it bucking or, or rearing and things like that. And um, this can, as I said, can be caused by fear, pain, confusion. Um, and so this extension response, uh, uh, again, is something that's trained as we should be trying to, to avoid because as soon as the horse stops thinking, we're, you know, it, it's a wild, it's a big, powerful animal and we're sitting on it and we're in danger. Um, and, it, it, of course, that extension response could just be brought on by just too much stimuli at dressage championships too mm. and suddenly the horse becomes fearful. Then you have to quieten the horse down and get it to start thinking in a positive way again. But generally the way to do it is not to ride harder, but just, you know, retire to somewhere where the horse can handle and start to think again and get its act together because it's just been overstimulated. So um, the flooding response is something that riders should be aware of. Yes, yes, Um, riders and trainers, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, And probably the last one is, that I think we need to understand is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yes. Now, in human, um, I think most people know know of it, mm-hmm. um, and it's often quoted. And uh, I, I break it down to easier. To, you know, in human psychology, it's you know physiological needs like air, water, food. Yep. Um, then safety needs like shelter and. and you know, whatever, social needs. Um, now, this is where we start to differentiate. You know, horses move in herds. They need that social interactivity if they're going to be sane, just like humans do too. And uh, if they're going to breed, you know, we need more foals and everything else. So, you know, social needs and all that sort of stuff comes into it. Now, next level for a horse, and as high as it gets, is serenity. That's what I mentioned earlier on in stimulus response training, that if I back off the stimulus the horse will reach that stage of serenity. I'm leaving it alone. Now, as good as it gets for a horse is when it's, you know, standing knee deep in grass under an apple tree and it's got foals galloping around and it's a warm day and it's wishing to tower the flies. You know, life is good. Mm-hmm. We as humans go one higher. We've got a thing called self actualization And, you know, that might just want to go and climb Mount Everest or ride dressage or show jumpers and things like this. Horses don't really have that. Um, so if keep thing, you know, as good as it gets for a horse is, being in a quiet space, well, we can, as trainers and coaches, we can encourage our, our students and, 
and our horses to to search for that. And I know as soon as a horse starts to give me what I want, um, I, I back right off and say, and just let the horse get on with the job. I, I don't keep saying, oh, it's got to be a bigger step, bigger step. That comes later on. Um, I, I say, well, I back off to the horse, and if it gives, continues to give me what I want, I'll just pull up and give it a, you know, a pat or encourage it with my voice. Mm-hmm. So it's very important that uh, as trainers we're quite aware of that Maslow's because, you know, much as we want to win the blue ribbon, the horse probably does not. Um, so, But he does want to be left alone. And that doesn't, you know, but you and I all have to work and horses in this modern world have to work to justify their existence. Uh, they're very expensive pets and we keep them for the sport of, yep. of riding yep. and things like that. So I don't begrudge the horse work, nothing. That's just mm. the way it is, and they've got a good life these days compared years ago. But uh, as a trainer, I, I'm very, very aware that I, I get a much better response from a horse if I allow quiet time, be it in the process of training or at the end of a, a training period. Like I, I can not ride a horse for more than 40 minutes these days, and after each training period of around five or six minutes, it's like a set when you're doing weights. Um, I, I give it a, a loose rein walk to get its head together, and then we come back at it. Yeah. Uh, I think horses, when they're fresh, always work way better. I think when they're tired or they've been ridden to the ground, they, they give a very poor response. Um, so I, I'm always trying to encourage the horse to to keep it fresh and its brain active and alive. I don't really want to dominate the horse. I want to work as a unit. Mm-hmm. So if I can, by being smart with these terms we're talking about, like habituation, stimulus response and flooding and serenity, if I can use these terms to to modify my horse's behaviour to give me a better result, well, I'm not wearing the horse out. There's only so many miles on the horse, just like there's so many miles on your tyres. If I just ride the horse into the ground to get a result, you know, sooner or later I'll break that horse down. But if I can modify the horse's behaviour by making it, teaching it to think and work with me, well, I'm not working as hard and the horse isn't working as hard and I'm going to get many more years out of that animal. Uh, yeah. A bigger investment and much more rewarding. Yeah. yeah. You're talking about understanding the principles and you've talked about these principles, but you're still going back to number two where you said horses can't think like humans, we have to think like a horse. So within each of the principles, you've still talked about how the horse thinks about the whole you know, the training and when you'd use that to benefit the horse. Yeah, it's um, yeah, very much so. And, uh, I, I, you know, and as I say, you, it's up to us to let the horse tell us. Mm-hmm. And it, it's amazing how often you sit in the ho- on the horse and, the, and what looks good from the ground is, is not good on the saddle. It, it, it stands out straight away. And like often you sit in the saddle and think, oh, the saddle's not putting me in the right spot. Mm. Or, Won't suit this rider. And, or, you know, the horse isn't sound, looks sound, but he's not sound. You know, the horse, you can feel an unsoundness much more than you can see it when it's very fine. Um, and, and it's up to the horse to show me. Yes. It, yeah. it really is, you know. And and it's, up, it's not for me to show the horse in those things. Because, yeah. As I say, a horse cannot lie. Yes. Um, so the horse has got, it, it, got its ways of communicating with me. And it's up to me to keep that pathway open. Okay, good. All right, we can move on to number six. And number six is riders do not know what they do not know. So lean on your support network. Do you want to explain a bit about Because, you know, lots of people talk about a support network from all sorts of problems. But talk about the support network as far as a rider or a trainer goes. Mm. Look, it, it's a long journey learning to ride. It takes it takes a lifetime, you know, and, and we can't know it all when we're young or when we've only been riding five or 10 or 20 or 30 years. It it, we get better and better as we get older. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, our support network is your, is your coach. And I, I think most of us start off with just getting a hand from another person in the paddock when we start riding. And they might mention they're going to a train or they get a dressage, whatever that is, and all these sorts of things. And then we start getting lessons. We tend to start off with coaches, or at least I did. I'm not sure about everyone, but I started off with some very average coaches. And that wasted a lot of time for me, unfortunately. But um, so I, I tend to use good coaches if I can. And you know, what's a good coach and what's not? That's that's a moot point. But but you've got your mentors as well. You've got people you should be working with and looking up to, and those people can guide you down a path. Also, reading. You know, there's the horse magazines and there's lots of books and things around. 
Um, and the podcast, uh, of course, John, you know, for people to listen to podcasts. Oh, podcasts, of course. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I've forgotten all that. Yeah, I'll actually be putting it out there, yes, for sure. And, um, you know, letting your horse show you what's wrong. That's what I've been saying all along, your eyes, your parents, if you're, if you're a child or a young person, um, your partner, if you're older, because you're obviously often your partner can see things going wrong. Um, my wife, Cheryl, oh, we used to have wagons when we first started riding, and she would say something to me, and I'd just ride off down to the end of the arena, <laughs> so she'd be there alone. But then... Now when I ride, I, I say to my wife, Cheryl, can you come down and give me a hand, please? Because she can see, Cheryl can see things that I can't. Mm. You know, I don't have a mirror on the ground. And even if I did have a mirror, Cheryl's got enough experience of sitting through lessons with me over many years to see if I'm my reins are too long or I'm not bringing that hind leg through. So your parents or your partner, they're not as blind as you think. Maybe they can't ride like you can, but you know what? They're smart. And they can see what's going on. So lean on your partners or the people who watch you in lessons, be they friends or and and your coach. If he's you know they've got to be approachable. We've got to be able to have a talk to them about what's going on and their plans. Um, I, I worked with the Queensland Institute of Sport and the University of Queensland with psychology, with riding and um, and other sports, triathlon and things like that as well. And. Um, the universities are very handy as is Queensland that you treat a sport because they give you training techniques and um, training strategies and ways to think and training goals and, and ways to modify how you think and how you set your goals because lots of people and remember we're athletes it's an Olympic sport you know be, at least the three big ones you know dressage show jumping and any these are Olympic sports so you know it's very easy to poo poo it's just, it's just riding but it's not we're athletes and we need to use every resource we can if you're going to be successful. I'm, I've been more than happy to use the university and the Queensland Institute of Sport to further my goals. Mm-hmm. Um, and plus all my coaches and and people who have mentored me through the years. Uh, I've been very, very lucky. Um, and I, I think you'll find that most successful writers will be the first to say that they've been blessed with people who have shown them a way to do it. It's, it's no accident that people are successful. It's. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of sweat. There's no denying that. But people have to. You've got to have some sort of guidance to get you through that path. So yeah, lean on them. You use these. Or use. That's probably the wrong word. But um, rely on these people to give you a hand because you're going to bloody need it. You mm. really are going to need it. And be. And that same for the coaching. If you're hoping to become a coach, it's you know nine parts perspiration, one part inspiration, and. Um, you're going to have to partner this terribly understanding as you're going out there and travelling all around the world and getting dumped on horses and by horses and you're going to rely on everybody in your life to to work with you yep. because you can't do it by yourself. Mm-hmm. This game you can't do by yourself. Okay. All right. And thinking, just moving on to the next one, you know, good advice, I think, for people who are travelling or looking to find the right partner. But let's move on to number seven. It takes years to understand the inside leg to the outside rein and the half halt. Yeah. Oh, God help us. Because um, you can read about years. it in a book in about five seconds. Yeah, it's simple. <laughs> it's almost like a bit of magic, isn't it? You know, the magic half halt. Yeah, the magic inside yeah. leg to outside rein. Yep. Oh, and every coach says it mm. if they're on the money. It's one of those phrases that are often parroted. I remember when I first started writing, I had no idea about either of those terms. And I had people yelling it and talking about it to me. I read about it just like we all did. Mm. And after a number of years, I thought, oh, what the heck are they on about? You know, really, really? I was going good now. Uh, and I'm winning. It's good enough. I'm doing okay. And then every so often I, I'd get a little glimpse. Oh, that's what they mean, you know? And then it would sort of just evaporate into the wind about that inside leg and the outside rein. And over the years, as I've done more and more lateral work, because it can't happen without an inside leg pushing into the outside rein, it started to make sense. And But it's taken so long. And maybe I'm just stupid, but I think there are lots and lots of riders out there who have no idea what it actually means, that they're just relying on their reins to control the horse and creating energy with their legs. It, it's much more than that. And from the inside leg to outside rein is basically later on what, what everyone calls a half hole. 
it's not just pulling on the rein to slow the horse down. It's got nothing to do with it. It's it's generating energy with your inside leg and you're catching, you're blocking it with your hand or catching with your hands a moment later. It comes down to what I said earlier on about a horse not being able to do two things at once, that if we put the accelerator and the brake on at the same time, we'll burn the clutch out. Mm. And it's the same on a horse. And so there's it, this a moment in time where the rain we use a blocking hand for a moment after we, we use that active leg to bring that hind leg through. It, it's not at the same moment. And these concepts, I mean, we can rattle on about them. But the, the thing is to to be happy with the journey and explore it and, and learn it. It's only by doing lateral work or, you know, what the Germans would call outside brain exercises that we can actually learn what a half halt is. And if you, if you have trouble with your lateral work, it's, you will also have trouble with your half halt. So as riders, I think we have a responsibility to ride the best we can. And that doesn't mean just sort of trotting around and winning ribbons. It means that we're trying to uh, achieve more. And But as I say, it's taken me many years to learn the concept. And you, you ask a student or a coach what, what a half halt is, and there's a hundred different responses and a hundred different explanations. And I think it's because there's a general confusion about it. But the goal of it, if you read what the FEI rulebook says, it's a clear explanation of what a half old is. But then, as you say, it's always said, but, you know, it's something that you've got to actually learn yourself. You know, I can teach you what that feels like. Mm, yes. It's something that you only get by watching the result. They Can you execute it properly? As I say, it's very ethereal, but it's something that, as riders, we've all got to learn and and not be satisfied with how we ride. Yeah. Yep. But it does take a long time. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. All right. Just moving on to number eight here. You've got where knowledge ends, violence begins. Would you like to talk about that? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, this uh, it's always been around. But I, uh, Well, I think it's an important subject to talk about. And I think it's a very brave of you, I think, to open it up and talk about it because it's a very real subject. Yeah. It, and it is. And what happens in private, you know, we We've got the ongoing debate about road core. Mm. I should explain what road core is, or I'm not sure if that's been mentioned to on other horse chat. We actually had Mary Seafried on, and she spoke about sort of from the Olympic Committee, saying that it's not something that they encourage, but it is something that is around. So certainly speak to us about that. Yeah, look, it's well, the road core is, is basically it's a. Um, Originally, the, the name comes from an East German um, antacid medicine for indigestion and things, and that you take the, the medicine and to spread it around your stomach, you'd have to roll on the floor. And so in, in German, it was a rolling cure, roll core. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's mm-hmm. where the word comes from. And it's a way of training a horse very deep to get it to lift its back, but which is fine. We often training a little bit deep will cause a horse to lift its back, which is a positive thing because it helps get the horse through. But when we take it to extremes, well, then it becomes negative because it shortens the forearm muscles of the horse. But on the positive side, then it makes an extravagant extended trots and, and paces, but they've been artificially obtained. So there's negatives and po- you know, positive and negatives to everything. So when it's done to extreme, it's bad news. Mm-hmm. So lots of things happen. Anyway, getting back to... Um, where violence begins, lots of things happen in private um, and also in the warm-up arena and in the in the competition arena because people don't understand how to do it any other way, um, like wrapping of horses or road core and, or uh, I was at a recent championship, dressage championship and the horses were being warmed up in double bridles and being competed in the low-level class and snaffles and the horses' heads were tied down to the, the chests between the classes um, I, I, I put a complaint in the ground committee about that, but they didn't uphold it, which is very much a shame. Um, because I, I think a horse should come on the bit for the engagement of the hind leg and the change of balance of the horse, not because we tie its head down. And it's yeah, it's just a, the lack of understanding that we then, for another way to achieve what we're looking for, and because humans are very visual, so if the horse is going around on the bit, they've got to be somewhere where they're doing it. If we can't achieve it correctly, well, hum, us as humans and being self-motivated, you know, self actualization we'll achieve it however we can. And so it, it shouldn't be an excuse for violence. It should be, if we're not getting what we want, it should be an excuse for having to learn to do it properly. 
So, um, you know, it, it's up to us to ex- to really expand our our understanding of the horse and and our knowledge of the horse and how a horse should work, rather than just relying on, on force to do what skill should do. But those skills, as I said earlier on, take a lifetime to learn. It'd be nice to put old heads on young shoulders, but that's not the way. And I've seen some truly horrible things at, at championships when we're putting complaints about some riders and things, and some of them being upheld, which is just terrific. And uh, But uh, overuse of the, the hand or the whip or, or even just, you know, you know, so many things go on that, that are just wrong. You shouldn't see a horse bleeding from spur marks or spur marks on a horse or blood in its mouth. And some of these these things are banned, but they, they must happen in private. And, and the other thing is violence isn't just about the violence of us com- putting it onto the horse. It also means that if a horse is sore or tired, you know, the horse will then will tune us out, will go into an extinction response, you know, like it will just, it will just stop responding in the way we wish it to respond because it's protecting itself either through exhaustion or, or fear um, or, uh, you know, uh, other emotions that the horse is quite capable of feeling. So it's up to me as a trainer to make sure the horse said that the horse is not trained in these methods because the horse is going to not walk. Well, the horse won't learn that way anyway. Um, and, and the other thing is, you know, as I said, where the horse, when knowledge ends, violence begins. But as trainers, and coaches, we shouldn't be training our our horses or our students or ourselves if we're tired, if we're stressed, if we're sore. Um, these are times when you shouldn't be sitting on a horse. Um, so if you're tired or you're stressed, you, your ability to reason may have gone out the window um, or make logical decisions. You're not going to be at your best. And the only time you should be on a horse is when you're at your best. So that point has lots of different factors to it. It's not just about brutalising the horse, and it, God knows it does happen. Uh, it, it's also uh, about being gentle on our animals and gentle on ourselves in, in this in this journey that we're taking as as trainers and as coaches. Yep, yep. Okay, and I think you know, as you say, the more knowledge you have, the more you know how far to push. You know how far to push yourself, how far to push the horse before it goes over the line. Yeah, that point of resistance, I think it's the term you see, is go, you say take a horse to the point of resistance but never past it. Mm. And, and it's a very, very valid comment. Once once the horse is resisting, um, it's fighting. It's no longer working with you. That's, that's not as a trainer what I'm trying to train. Uh, I don't want the horse to resist. I, I want it to try. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if horse is resisting me... Um, I'm training incorrectly, so I don't want that. Mm-hmm. Um, I really don't. You know, it's it's up to me to keep lines of communication open. But, um, yeah, so you've shown me a lot of this sort of stuff as well, Gwyneth, and it's all really relevant. I think you come from a teaching background before horses, did you, or did you start straight into horses? A bit the opposite, actually. I started off as a coach, then through coaching, did a teaching degree and became a teacher. <laughs> so a little bit opposite, yeah. But then, of course, went back to horses because that's what I want to do, yeah. Yeah, we, I can see in how you teach, you, you, you act more like a teacher than a trainer. Mm. Um, mm. Not like a teacher, more like um, someone who's got experience of teaching. That's mm. the reason why I thought maybe that's how you've done it, but the mm. other way around. But I can see that those influences. And, you know, if, if you're teaching children, there, there's very little difference. We can reason for the child a bit better than the horse. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> take that back. <laughs> I'll take that back. That was a silly statement. Yeah, so anyway. Um, so, yeah, you've you got to think about it. if we can't do it, don't, you know, as my Christian teacher used to say to me, he said, you know, ride better. Yep, yes, yes. Yeah, you, you know, it's not about riding with more force. It's a matter of riding better. Oh, hang on a sec. Let me interrupt to let people know about the horse industry qualifications at onlinehorsecollege.com. If you have a look at the flexible options, there's online theory and the practical components can be completed by video or with a qualified expert in your area. That website again is onlinehorsecollege.com. Okay, thanks. I think that brings us on to number nine here because you've got next, try to be a better rider. What do you need to do to be a better rider? What would you say? If someone said to you, I want to be a better rider, what would you say to them? Keep an open mind. Mm-hmm. Um, 
years ago, I would have poo-pooed some sore sports. Yep. Uh, th- these days, I'm much more open to everything. I'm, like I, I was for many years very much a dressage purist, uh, yep. but then you, you got me jumping, mm-hmm. uh, which is nice. And I've done a lot of other horse sports, be it race horses or mustering and, and bits and pieces. The trick to being a better rider is to ride lots of horses. Uh, I don't just mean one or two a week. Uh, if you can, if you're, if you're a trainer or if you're in the lucky position of, of training horses, well, you might ride 10, 15, 20 horses a week, different horses a week or, or five or seven a day. That gives you a lot of comparison. It teaches you what's the norm. In the, in the horse's response, and it teaches you what's acceptable and what's unacceptable because a lot of riders don't understand what's an acceptable response from a horse, and when they don't get it in the human term, they then get either dirty at the horse or they accept a substandard response, and, and neither of those situations is good. So um, either once the horse is trying and they don't recognise it or, or the horse is given a substandard response and they accept it, so the training pathway is closed. So ride lots of horses. Be strict on yourself. I've been lucky. I I rely on my wife to tell me if my hands are moving too much or my legs are moving and my instructors or or coaches. Uh, But be hard on yourself. If your leg is moving, you you cannot progress as a rider. Mm. If your hands are moving, you cannot progress as a rider. If if you've got problems with your lower back, get them sorted because if you have got problems with your lower back, you're not going to be able to sit the trot. Uh, there's so many things that, that that really make limit us as riders, be it age, weight, physical fitness, all sorts of things limit us, and, and knowledge, as we've been saying all along through this. So if you want your horse to work like an Olympic athlete, well, then you have to be like an Olympic athlete. It's unfair to expect a horse to to be at the top of their game and looking gorgeous and and we go out and just let the, and we let the horse down. Yep. So yep. it. Um, you know, we've got these marvellous athletes that that we care for and love, and, and then we don't look at ourselves in the mirror and say, "Well, am I am I as good as I could be?" Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of people say, "Well, you know, that's good enough." Or, "Why do I need lessons?" Or, um, "You know, I've got the blue ribbon," uh, and often that's uh, that's not nowhere near good enough. I, you know, the, the sky's the limit. There's a never-ending journey on, on learning to ride. And I'm always trying to keep my lower deck stiller and, and and ride quietly and understanding that the falls of the horse and where each leg is all the time. And, you know, in, in any horse sport, be it raining or cutting or camp drafting, it, it all comes down to this harmony and unity. And if I'm not a good rider, I shouldn't be expecting a horse to be a good horse. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. All right, the last one you've got, and I know before you said ride with quiet eyes, but you've got here a quiet mind. Stay open to what your horse is trying to tell you. This is number 10. Yeah. I think it really sums it up, doesn't it? You know? Yeah. yeah, it does. Yeah, and that leads back to the very first point. And if I don't have a quiet mind when I get on a horse, like if I had an argument with the missus or, you know, the ATO is running me up or something like that, um, I, there's no time where I should be getting on a horse because my mind is not quiet. The horse is, I won't be able to let the horse in. Mm-hmm. Uh, and once I can feel the horse walking underneath me, I can my body swings softly side to side as we're going along and, you know, getting that lovely back massage, which a walk is, um, and when we're starting to communicate, we're getting together, well, then I can pick the horse up a little bit and start communicating. But until, I, until I'm at that point where, I, where I'm quiet, sitting quietly and, and just becoming an extension of the horse, uh, and that's the ideal, where I'm just sitting there quietly and, and, and part of the horse, and I'm only going to do that by keeping my eyes soft and my body soft and moving and keeping the pathways open, keeping my brain open to what's going on. And then I can start leading the horse through the exercises I want to do. I don't want to dominate the horse. Mm-hmm. I want to lead it. I want to modify its behavior for sure, but I don't want to boss it around. Um, let the horse and let the horse tell you what's it, what's right and what's wrong, what it finds easy and what's fine hard. Just and even though the way I'm talking, you know, as this is an old saying that a good horse is never made by a dry saddle blanket. Um, and that's sort of true. So that doesn't mean even though I'm saying, you know, all these nice friendly phrases about letting the horse in and ride quietly, that doesn't mean I'm not working hard. Yeah. You know, I'll be sweating. Yeah. But uh, I'm still working as a unit. And we're working together and we're working hard. And the horse recognises that. And I recognise it from the horse. So 
but lead the horse through what you're trying to do. Don't, you know, as I said earlier on, make the right thing easy. Make mm, the wrong mm. thing hard. You know, there's two doors you can go through. You can go through the easy door or the hard door. But I always try to lead the horse way to the easy door and say, well, this is this is the way it is. There'll be serenity here. I'll back off. Yep. You, you just keep performing. You know, you might be working your guts out, but you can be quiet. I can work hard and I can, I can, ex- I can go for a run this afternoon or ride my bike or something and I can be busting my gut, but I'm still enjoying it. Yeah. And, yep. and it's the same for the horse. I, I don't think... I've seen some horses hate being ridden, for sure. And some horses just resign to the fact they're being ridden. Their the minds are fried. They're, mm-hmm. they're shut down. They're no longer uh, a thing of beauty. They're just a dominated beast like a like a donkey in a carriage in Egypt or somewhere, you know. And um, That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for partnership. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it, it, you've got to have a quiet mind to get to those, those points. So I don't hop on a horse if I'm stressed. If I'm tired, you know, I'm already behind the eight ball. I probably won't find what I'm looking for if I if I hop on a horse in those frames of mind. If I'm in that frame of mind, I go and read a book. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So, All um, right. I think that sort of pretty much sums it up, John. I think those ten tips to train in harmony, they're going to be on John's page on horsechats.com. It'll be horsechats.com slash John Downs Two, or just go to horsechats.com, search for John search for Downs. And before we go, John, what about your contact details if people would like to get in contact with you? What's the best way? I mean, your contact details are going to be on your page anyway and Horse Chats, but um, if you could, if someone's got their ready to go now and get in contact details, what are they? That'd be great, Dennis. Um, available on phone and emails. Um, and we've got a website. So um, on the it's Downs on the email address is Downs, D A W N E S, Equestrian, that's like in horses, E Q U E S T R I A N, at bigpond.com. Mm-hmm. We're on Facebook, and the mobile phone number is 0429 486 839. Good. And John on Facebook, are you on Downs Equestrian? Yes, Downs Equestrian or John Downs. We're under yep. both. Okay. Probably John Downs is probably easier. Um, we've got two pages, so either will work. So just contact us, and we're round and about. You'll see us round and about doing schools and things. But no more than happy to have people come up and talk. We're midway between Mitchell and Roma in Western Queensland, mm-hmm. so um, there's not too many people out here. <laughs> but, um, but we do travel to the coast from time to time. Good. All right, John, good to talk to you, and um, hopefully we'll talk to you again sometime soon. Okay, Glennis. Thank, thank you. you very much. Bye. Bye, mate. Now, if you're still there, you probably know that I'm absolutely passionate about education within the horse industry. That's why I host this podcast. My other venture is Online Horse College. Have a look now at onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below 